some power. He's biting me. These are red-footed tortoises, without a doubt one of the most easily recognizable species and even one of the most beloved. Stick around because in this video I'm going to tell you quite a bit about them. Redfoot tortoises are definitely the most famously known South American species, and they typically occur in the more northern portions of South America. They're found in various areas from Colombia to Brazil to Bolivia, Guyana, Suriname. They have a very expansive range, and what's really interesting about them is they actually have regional variations. So not unlike the testudo species, the Hermans and the Greek tortoises, they vary in appearance and even size and even shape depending on where they come from. As far as habitat preferences go, they also prefer a wide range of habitats. They can be found in grassy areas, they can be found in moist, damp woodlands, and we've kind of tried to create a little bit of everything for them here. This species is very fond of water. Think of them like a giant box turtle, and when I say giant, these animals can grow to be between 14 and even upwards of 18 inches, usually for the males, that will often get larger than the females. So we set up our habitat here outside in a way that the animals can find different things to use according to their needs or their personal preferences at that very moment. There are three different bodies of water in here. They're natural type ponds in a sense where I can fill them up with water, they'll actually retain the water for a while and there's even some aquatic vegetation and then when we get droughts they'll drain out and then I can fill them back up again so the animals have constant access to fresh water. Like box turtles, they have a relationship with water. They don't swim or submerge the way a box turtle would, but they absolutely can swim across pretty decently sized bodies of water and they utilize them here in captive management like you can't imagine. In fact, I'm almost always finding our redfoot tortoises burying into mud to cool off and of course going for a nice soak. These are shallow ponds. So the animals can stand up in them and they barely cover the tops of their carapaces. There's also a lot of low-lying vegetation in the form of grasses and shrubs because as I said they do move into grasslands but they also have plenty of shade. South New Jersey has extremely high humidity and blistering hot summers with a lot of thunderstorms. So you can imagine a South American species like a redfoot tortoise definitely appreciates a summer out here. Our adults get to stay outside from March or April depending on the spring and how it's going all the way through Halloween. So they get a nice long portion outdoors here, as do most of the species we keep at Garden State Tortoise that don't naturally hibernate. Redfoot tortoises are part of the genus Kelonoidus, along with the famous Galapagos tortoise. So we actually allow our Galapagos tortoises, Jack and Sally, to live with our redfoots while they are very small. They're still not as big as our redfoot tortoises are. Right now they're about seven inches, but eventually they'll have to be moved out of this enclosure because they are going to become tremendous compared to the redfoots. Redfoot tortoises are omnivores. In fact, they eat a lot of animal matter, so they're not going to hesitate to look for things in here like invertebrates, worms, snails, slugs, even isopods. But if there's a dead animal in the wild, like a bird or a mammal or even another reptile, they will not hesitate to eat it. They actually require protein in their diet when compared to something like a sulcata tortoise that really should be living off a grassland type diet. Water and humidity are crucial for a redfoot tortoise to grow properly and attain a smooth shell. You can see this guy right here, he was raised too dry early on in life. He didn't get that precious humidity or hydration or be allowed access to something like a pond or a large water dish, so he grew a little bit too lumpy. Whereas this animal here is nearly completely smooth as he would be if he grew up in nature. So that's something you really have to consider right off the bat is providing a species like a redfoot tortoise. Again, that's South America where it's very humid with appropriate hydration and humidity humidity from the start. Lucky for this guy it's just cosmetic, but you can see just how bumpy he is when you compare him to this guy right here. Pretty big difference. Something right here that's pretty easy to notice if you look at these animals from a bird's eye view is how to properly sex them. Now this male right here is not fully grown yet. He will eventually be larger than this female. But one of the things you're gonna notice right off the bat is that he has a figure eight shape when you look at him from the top. 
See that? See how he's pinched in at the waist right there? That's a telltale classic sign of many regional variants of red foot tortoise that it is in fact a male. The other way you're going to be able to tell that it's a male is simply by looking at the tortoise's underside. Talk about concave. Can you see that concavity right there? That's how he could fit on the back of the female during mating. He also has an absolutely tremendous tail. Now, when we compare him to our female here, she's gonna have more of a classic oval shape. She's not gonna be pinched in at the waist there. She's gonna have a flat or level plastron and a much smaller tail. You'll also notice that her anal scoots have more of a sharper curve to them instead of being flared out and wide. So you heard me mention regional variants. Well, this is one right here. Now, most people think that this animal really should be promoted to at least a subspecies of the redfoot tortoise. And this is the famous cherryhead tortoise. No surprise why it gets that name. They are known for the unbelievable deep red coloration on the head, primarily the head, and then of course onto the legs. So you can see, you know, they are a redfoot tortoise, but there are a lot of things that are different about these animals. Typically, they are smaller than your more classic forms of redfoot. They're a little bit more oval and they also have a distinct plastron. The plastron of the regular redfoot tortoise has a lot more yellow and orange to it, whereas the cherry head has a lot of black with cream centers, blotching, or even marbling. They're really an amazing tortoise, and a lot of people prefer these, but nonetheless, they are a redfoot, and they're every bit as personable and hardy as the other ones. These tortoises typically come out of Brazil, and that was the locale that many of these were poached from over the years for the pet trade unbelievable tortoise. They also have a very pointed snout when compared to the more northern or regular red foot tortoise, but I'm sure you guys can notice those similarities. All right, so we talked about adult red foot tortoises. Let's take it all the way back to when their days first started. You need to know how to properly raise the hatchlings because it's crucial for things to be right from day one. Because this species is so prone to deformities, especially of the carapace in the form of lumpiness, that things can go wrong very easily. Think of these little ones, or should I say little ones, as box turtles. The redfoot tortoises are not all that little from day one. In fact, they're pretty large. These are weak old redfoot tortoises, and even the eggs are pretty huge. When you compare these eggs to other species, even other large species like radiated tortoises, these animals are already set up for size. They lay big eggs and they hatch big, but that doesn't mean they're not sensitive. This is what I'm talking about. All this is, is a simple storage tote that you can get from Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, any store really that carries this kind of stuff for home and office. And well, they're inexpensive and they are extremely effective at creating a closed chamber or very high humidity environment for a baby redfoot tortoise and many other types of tortoises and also box turtles. If you guys saw the video we did, how to raise baby tortoises, this is exactly what we used and redfoot tortoises couldn't be any more suitable for this particular style. So the size I have here is a 66 quart Again, very easy to find. It has some height to it, which is what you want, because what you're going to do is use the lid at all times. And what you're gonna do is take a utility knife, cut out a big oval so that you can fit a dome lamp, but you want a combo dome lamp because you want UVB on one side and you want basking on the other side. Now, as far as the importance and requirements of UVB when it comes to redfoot tortoises, that's really up in the air. New studies suggest that maybe these tortoises don't need it, but err on the side of caution. Using these style UVB bulbs is actually safe because you're not blasting the animal in one spot causing any kind of issues like blindness with the eyes. You want this to be on one far corner of the enclosure so that the animal can go to the UVB when it needs it and that's also where the basking light will be. For something like this, all you need is a 50 watt daylight bulb. You can just use a simple indoor outdoor floodlight for that or a reptile basking bulb. If your room is cooler, maybe you wanna get something a little bit warmer, but out here in our reptile building, it is pretty warm and we don't wanna overheat in here. Generally, what you wanna see for redfoot tortoises, especially during the day, are temperatures in the 80s with a basking area in the 90s and 80 to 90% humidity at all times. If your building or room is staying in the 70s at night, you can turn the lights off and not have to worry about anything. But if you are keeping it in an air-conditioned house or a room where it does get cold, you're gonna wanna leave some kind of heat source on like a ceramic heat emitter 
or some kind of heater in the room to keep the animal in the 70s at night. They can get cooler, and I often let them get cooler, but err on the side of caution. We're not talking about a European tortoise species that goes through all four seasons where they're used to hibernating and stuff like that. This is a tropical tortoise, South America, folks. This animal needs humidity and warmth at all times. This size storage tote is suitable to start off two baby redfoot tortoises. I wouldn't put any more animals in this and it won't be long before you're going to need to upgrade to an even larger size because we're talking about a tortoise that's going to get probably at least 12 to 14 inches if not larger and they do tend to grow fast. Remember the objective of a baby tortoise is to get out of that vulnerable size which makes it vulnerable to predators and to adult size as quickly as possible. It doesn't mean you should rush their growth but you have to be ready for the future. So let's put these two in here. Notice they're drinking right away. Again, water is so important to this species because of the relationship it holds with it. So a water dish, a shallow one that they cannot drown in and that they can easily right themselves in should they flip over is crucial. I use terracotta saucers, they're perfect. You can easily clean them and replenish fresh water every single day. And what you wanna do with this style enclosure is keep it simple. Baby tortoises spend 90% or more of their time staying hidden in nature, so they don't need to have too much to explore when they're only this young. We're dealing with weak old baby redfoots right here right now, folks. So all they need, maybe a little bit of fake plant life, because anything live they're gonna try to eat. And if you don't know what's toxic or non-toxic, you're obviously gonna run into an issue there. They need a nice place to hide where they can easily fit into that's dark, and they need a substrate that retains moisture well. I'm using a combination of Zoomed's Reptisoil, Sphagnum Moss, and Cypress Mulch all mixed together. I'm using about three inches of it and I never let it dry out. Then the key factor to keeping this humid is putting the lid on and leaving it on at all times. You're loud. Lid stays on with the lights on. That builds the heat and humidity. And no, you don't have to worry about damaging this or causing burns. We've been doing this method for a long time. You can use Gorilla Tape to hold it in place. Or if you want to get fancy, you can even fit the opening with a mesh. This works wonderfully and it has worked for years with a wide variety of tortoise species, particularly these humid dwelling ones like redfoot tortoises, yellowfoot tortoises, and even elongated tortoises. And in fact, we started our Galapagos tortoises off in something very similar to this and man are their shells smooth. So how long will this style unit last for redfoot tortoises? Well, you really have to leave that up to yourself and gauge the size and behavior of the animals. Once these animals start passing that hatchling stage, you're gonna notice the colors change. They use that yellowy orange shell and they start getting more black with just the orange or yellow center, as you saw with the adults. They're gonna start getting to about three inches in size. You're gonna start dealing with an overcrowded situation, so you're gonna to wanna to expand once you see those animals really start to bulk up. So no, this may not last that long, but you can do the Christmas tree bins, which are even bigger, which should at least keep your baby redfoot tortoises comfortable for the first year. Now, if you wanna get fancy, you can move into something like a toad ranch enclosure, which you see behind me. But keep in mind, that's only gonna do well for the juvenile stage because of the eventual adult size. Our redfoot tortoises, as you saw, have a massive pen outdoors, and they have kind of like horse stall enclosures indoors on the other side of our building where they can spend a few months of winter out of the cold. Redfoot tortoises are widely bred across the world, and in fact, they often end up in rescue situations, not unlike sulcata tortoises. Every single redfoot tortoise that we have here at Garden State Tortoise was a rescue or surrender, so you can always check out your local reptile or animal rescue to see if they have one up for adoption. As you guys can see, they are very rewarding to work with, as they have some of the boldest personalities in the turtle and tortoise world. They're not for everybody. They are a big animal. They are tropical dwellings, so they do need indoor housing at least part of the year throughout much of at least the United States of America, but they are also very hardy and they are a forgiving species too. So they're not one that you have to be on top of 24 seven all the time. These animals are resilient and they are able to survive. And again, remember they are like a big box turtle. The humidity, the diet, their personality, their habits, it's all very much like box turtles. So whether it's the Northern Redfoot Tortoise or the wonderful Brazilian Cherry Head, Redfoot Tortoises are an exceptional, gorgeous, intelligent, and personable animal worthy of every single bit of attention that the world has given them. If you guys wanna see more species-specific profiles, drop your ideas in the comments.